Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, second important event today that we have in uh, Bruegel on uh, China EU. Um, and this uh, afternoon session is um, going to deal with China's digital uh, economy. Now, the fact that we pick the digital sector is not just a coincidence. It is really a very important sector for economic growth because of the new opportunities uh, that arise from advances in digital technology. Uh, in itself, so hardware, but also increasingly in software and services. Um, <clears throat> so that means that the digital sector is really a very important sector in the corporate uh, R&D landscape here. It is the biggest sector, and it's likely to become perhaps even more important in the future with all the next waves. Think of the next uh, artificial intelligence wave. But the importance of the digital sector is perhaps even more explicit uh, because it's also a general purpose technology that leads to very important opportunities for growth in sectors that adopt these digital technologies uh, to improve their innovations and productivity growth here. And that holds also particularly for artificial intelligence, which is so powerful because of its general purpose technology. Think of the trends that are going on in, in cars with electric and autonomous driving, but also in pharma, where a lot of innovations are actually driven by the application of digital, uh, among others, artificial intelligence technologies here. So getting a better grip on this digital landscape is really important uh, because it's such a strategic uh, sector uh, here. Um, and it has also has it also has some spe specific characteristics. It's a digital landscape uh, here. Uh, it's it's first and foremost a landscape uh, where winners take most uh, of the cake here. Uh, there is an important advantage to size, economies of scale, but particularly also from network effect. Uh, it's definitely a global sector uh, here, um, and where innovation is very important for comparative advantage and for innovation what really matters, the critical resource is attracting talent uh, with a war for talent uh, definitely uh, going on. Um, on the other hand, there's also fast changes in technology here, so new leaders can, can quickly come in or uh, established leaders need to continuously reinvent here. So in the end, although it's a very turbulent sector, the landscape will anyway be determined by a few large global innovation digital uh, leaders uh, here. And then, of course, it matters to know who these big players uh, are. And then if you look at EU, US, China, uh, the US has been for a long time at the frontier, certainly in the first wave. That was basically because it also has a very strong science and technology system supporting the strong universities, strong big corporates uh, here. So we all know the Intels, the Googles, the Facebooks, uh, the Amazons uh, here. Um, in digital, the, the EU may have some science and technology strengths in particular uh, certain areas here might have also some corporate startups here, but misses really these large digital players here, um, and therefore um, misses critical positions in this digital sector here. It also uh, misses adopting these digital technologies as fast as, as some of the other uh, regions uh, here. But in digital, China's rise is really incredibly impressive uh, here. So from its first digital wave, where it was mostly supplying the US digital value chains of the large players here without ca capturing much value. Now it really moves, uh, is moving up very fast in the value chain, building its own innovation capacity based on investments in important basic science and technology infrastructure here, where particularly the growth of uh, STEM graduates uh, in, in uh, engineering, mathematics, and, and technology, trained in China at universities that are quickly moving up to become world excellent uh, places uh, here, on top of keep on sending Chinese students and scholars uh, to the best places in the world here uh, and bringing them back. Um, also, a big advantage for China is its big market, a large uptake uh, of that market of these digital technologies by consumers, by businesses, but also by the government, which is also important uh, uptaker of these digital technologies. Um, and of course, also backed by government strategic long-term plan to support this indigenous uh, development of China in particular areas, including digital, uh, here, including uh, uh, AI here. And the result of that is that indeed in digital, uh, China has really made very strong uh, 
inroads. It has already now also very important big players uh, here. Uh, so if you think of on the hardware side, Huawei, ZTE, but also on the software side, uh, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Uh, so it has the big players and it can actually use this massive resource, which is these STEM graduates that are being trained, uh, that feed up a lot of startup activities here, but also feed up a lot how these big players can actually use the startups and, and, and um, build their own capacities here, together with the market for, for take up here. So on digital, I think it's pretty clear that China is no longer developing or catching up uh, here in digital. It sits at the frontier and in, in certain new areas, particularly like in artificial intelligence, it is really pushing uh, the frontier here and may perhaps even be outdoing the US, but in any case, definitely uh, Europe uh, here. So if we want to discuss what the best policies are, uh, like we were this, this morning, uh, the, between the EU, the US, and, and China here? Should they be multilateral? Should they be bilateral? Should they be focusing on trade, on innovation, industrial policy, on competition policy? We really need to understand this digital landscape very well because it's such an important uh, uh, sector uh, here. And this is why uh, we're very lucky to have today here, or you're very lucky uh, to have today two great experts that you can listen to that have a lot of experience in this area here, a lot of expertise uh, here. Uh, and by the way, it's an all-female panel, <laughs> which is for this topic uh, quite uh, exceptional, <laughs> I think. So um, the plan is to first give the words to Alicia uh, Garcia Herrero, uh, who has worked, uh, so she has a huge experience in, in, in China. Um, here she uh, holds various positions, she's incredibly uh, active uh, here. You see she's a professor at the City University of Hong Kong, the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, the China EU International Business School. She held previous positions at IMF, uh, the Bank of International Settlement, Bank of Spain, ECB, I can continue with that. So, um, she works very recently on a working paper on how big is Chinese digital economy, and that's the work she's going to present here, joint work with Chang Wei Su. So, Alicia, I hope you have recovered from the yeah. previous session now to, <laughs> to be able to Thank take you. the floor. Maybe if, I don't know if we have a, if not a pointer, something to show some slides. Uh, yep. Yeah. No. But the thing is, if there is nothing, I can always talk. That's the problem. <laughs> but anyway, uh, while the thing is ready, and perhaps I get something to move the slides, um, I wanted to first clarify that the topic is massively large. Yeah, China's digital economy, China's innovation. We could, and what I'm going to do here is really very, very tiny, because I'm only going to talk about the size of. Uh, China's digital economy, which is one of the, the thank you, one of the very many topics we could discuss, and therefore I'm going to be very brief because the the juice of the discussion is not really on how big it is, which is what I'm going to show, and this is because this was um, a commission paper by the IMF, uh, which was trying to do exactly that: look at uh, the digital, how to measure the digital economy. So the, the, our contribution was really to measure China's digital economy. But what is most important is the takeaways of, of how that may actually change China and the world. And I hope we can deal with that in, after Claudia in the discussion. So bear with me, it's going to be quite boring. I warn you already. Um, so how big is China's digital economy? Perhaps I should start by any guess. I guess most people in the audience would argue the biggest in the world. Yeah, because we we read nonstop and, you know, we just heard from one of the participants to the previous session that China's digital payments are, what, 85, 80 times the U.S. or something of that order, massive. So, you know, when you hear all of those things and what you just said, you would imagine that China's digital economy is the largest in the world. And I'm going to show that that's not yet the case. It might be the case in the future, but it's not yet the case. Whether that is relevant for the policy discussion, I'm not sure. But I think it's fair to say that, as you could imagine, actually, given China's um, uh, point in the development, yeah, which and especially the, the divergence in income across provinces, why would you expect China to have the largest digital economy in the world? Not yet. That's the only thing I'm going to show. 
And to do that, the problem is uh, that I can't move this thing. Yes. I know it's very <laughs> difficult. Every time yeah. I come to Bruegel, I know yes. that I need to find the trick to yes. somewhere high up there. There is a, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm going to move to motivate the paper. I don't think it requires any motivation because anybody wants to know how China is doing on its digital strategy. Oh my God. It's just trial and error. <laughs> Experiment. That's uh, okay. So the thing is, uh, we are not the only ones trying to measure China's digital economy. There is a lot of official measures. Uh, National Bureau of Statistics, or even non-official like Caixin, they have their own index of, China, of the size of China's economy. But because they are indices, they try to measure the growth. And the growth is astounding. I have no problem with that. What we do in this paper is to measure the actual value added in the economy, how big it is compared to the rest of that massive economy anyway. So, so this is why perhaps our findings are slightly different. Uh, yeah, I have to be very imaginative to talk while I can't move this thing. Uh, yes, yes, please. That would be nice. Uh, yeah, oh, you're so much better. <laughs> so this is the international compar comparison. The thing we do is to look at the OECD. The OECD has its own uh, annual reports measuring the digital economy of many economies in the world. It so happens that China is not included. And this is part of the, actually what we were discussing in the previous session of China being a massively important economy in the world, but for whatever reason, not really there in many of these, maybe old fashioned, but still relevant institutions we created in the past. And, and that we have a problem sometimes uh, in really analyzing how China fits into the rest of the picture. And one is really the OECD, China not being a member of the OECD. And, and not being a member of the OECD, uh, for, uh, for better or worse, also implies that we don't have China in this picture. But what we know is that Japan and Korea, Iran, I would argue, is a little bit of a tricky case. I won't get into that one here. But, um, but in general, Japan and Korea are, are among, you know, at the top of the scale, at least in value added. And, and high up together with other countries in terms of employment in the ICT sector. So where, is, where should we place China? That's really what we do in, 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 and you know, the things we know is really about exports of ICT goods. It's not value added, it's exports. And export wise, yeah, I mean, China is at the top of the list. Um, but this is also because China exports so many things, including ICT products. That doesn't necessarily mean that this, the share of value added of the ICT or digital sector in China is so big. So that's exactly what we try to do. I, I rely on your wisdom, uh, Rain Hildy, on, on moving this thing. Yes, I know. It's, uh, it's kind of every time you. So um, uh, now. Uh, exporting ICT goods is not the end of the story because ICT increasingly is about services. So we look at the export of ICT <coughs> services by China, and there you start seeing that you know it's not at the top of the of the list, and there are other countries that are much larger than than China. Um, so. Anyway, yeah, I, I'm happy with that. Move on, because it's too many graphs to show, and I want to get to the policy discussion as soon as possible. Um, so here I'm just going to go a little bit in more detail as to how the China calculates these indices, again, not value-added indices, and what they put in there. So they use, you know, basically all kinds of ICT, techno communi uh, communi uh, communication technology, um, so the, they, they, this is what the G20 tells the digital economy should include. This is what the OECD includes. I'm going to show you what the MBS includes. Very different. This is why also our results are so different. They look at China's new economy. So anything that is new economy is included in the index. So you could have, for example, um, you have it there. I mean, internet broadband users. It's more of a demand type. It's not value added. It's more how many users do you have for everything you do digital, which is a very different 
uh, topic. And of course, in this uh, in, in this uh, realm, the growth rate is massive, 40 percent in the course of 2015, which is the data we have by MBS. So we move on. This is just to give you a sense of what they do as opposed to what we do. Um, um, so. So when, when we move to Caixin Indies, they do use uh, so sort of supply-driven measure, which is based on a standard production function. And uh, they have so labor and input, uh, labor input, capital input. So this sounds a little bit more like what we try to do. However, it's an index. So it has massive growth rate, but we, we don't really know, you know the share in GDP, which is what, what we do. So uh, moving on, this is uh, basically the comparison of the topics that are included in Caixin and MBS. We move on. This is very technical. Um, and now I go to what we actually do. So we use input-output tables uh, uh, following exactly what the OECD does to look at which sectors are digital in the Chinese economy and how they contribute, because we want value added. Yeah? We don't want to count things, which is the criticism that I would have with the Caixin and the MBS measures, uh, count things several times, but just uh, through value added. And we just go through the very same. Uh, uh, so you see there what we include, from telecommunication devices to wire cables. So really everything that could be considered digital economy software, etc. And that's where we place China. And this is kind of the surprise, because as you can see, it's not very high up in the list, is below Greece, which is in itself, I, I must say that I had to present this paper at the IMF with uh, Tencent and Alibaba as um, uh, discussions, which wasn't as easy as it's going to be with Claudia, I hope. And, and you know, it was tough because it's like, how come? I mean, this can't possibly be true. But the point is, think about employment. And there you get already the sense of why this is the case. Uh, for employment, is below Spain, my home country. And I'm like, can't possibly be true. But the reality is China is very big. China has a massive hinterland, has provinces that you know have nothing to do with the ones where we have in mind when we talk about the digital economy. And in fact, if, it were, if I were to exclude all of that rural sector, it would move well you know, into the countries that you can imagine are comparable to China. So that's the key, which we tend to forget when we think about China's innovation, China's digital economy, etc. Uh, and most importantly, um, the relative labor productivity of the IT sector in China, because now we're, okay, forget about how big. This is a relative measure. So uh, when I do this, it, because China is such a diver, diversified economy, when I measure the productivity of the ICT sector to the rest, it's very high because the rest is low. Again, this is the issue when thinking about China. China has done great strides, I agree with you, but it has a massive hinterland, which will support the development, though, because it's a massive market to work on, but which is not yet there. So we will continue to see this massive growth for years and years to come. So, so I don't want to read that as a negative issue, but actually as a positive issue, that, that hopefully if there is diffusion of all of this digitalization to the hinterland of China, we would be seeing very high growth rates of digitalization for years to come. This is the key message of the, of the paper. And you see that in terms of ICT share of employment is basically Guangdong, Shanghai, Beijing, that's it. And then, you know, going down very, very quickly. So if you only focus on those three provinces, it's higher than Finland. Just that China is very big. So I, I was trying to calm down Alibaba and Tencent in this. It's just, it's not your problem. It's that, you know, you have so much more to do elsewhere than the key provinces or tier one cities of China. So the paper basically tries to review something that might be like taken for granted, that China's digital economy is already there, is massive, and there's nothing that we can do about it. I think this is a slightly uh, uh, stretched uh, argument of where we are in China today, because the reality is that um, while the growth is massive, the level 
in terms of value added, size of the, the digital economy to total economy is still relatively small. And this only shows the direction. Whatever we've seen so far is going to only continue with a larger and larger market as more and more provinces become more digitalized. In the, and this is just to show that when you, the, the growth rates of China, not only China, also China Taipei, or Taiwan, if I may use that uh, expression, if I dare, in Europe, uh, it's, it's so much faster than the rest of the developed world. So, it's, so actually, if you think about it, it's not only China, it's basically, I would argue, Asia, and especially Korea, Japan, Taiwan, China. Where is Europe in this story? So we could perhaps talk a little bit more about where we are. Um, so positive signals, it, it, the fact that the size is small should not be taken as a criticism of uh, something that looks real but is not real. That's not what I mean here. What I mean is that we should be aware of the very different realities across provinces in China, even in terms of digitalization. Um, and the fact that the labor productivity in the digital sector is so massive relative to the rest, and the dif that the diffusion is going to be so fast, already tell us that this is going to contribute positively to China's growth down the road. So think about total factor productivity. I know that a lot is needed because China is aging, because the return on assets is very low for China to keep a certain level of growth, but this is going to help for sure. Because it's like the, I call it a new urbanization. You know, when we think that China grew so fast thanks to urbanization, moving people uh, to the cities, this is another type of urbanization. You need to get to that level of the size of the digital economy in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangdong, elsewhere. That's going to bring massive growth to China. And I think we sometimes forget about uh, this thing that is not everywhere yet, i.e., there will be more growth coming from the digitalization of the Chinese economy that we are expecting now. It's not a ripe sector. It is not geographically. So, so I guess these are my conclusions. Thank you, <laughs> Rangel, for doing the job for me. Thank you very much. It's a bit experiment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. It's wonderful how you were able to uh, present after uh, such already a long um, event this morning and then even presenting on my instructions <laughs> of, the, of the slides here, which you did a great uh, job uh, here. So as I already said, we, we really are very happy to, uh, to have uh, two top experts uh, here. So the other expert is Claudia Vernotti uh, here. So she's a co-founder um, and currently director of China EU. She has a lot of experience uh, and expertise uh, in China. She studied, worked there. Uh, for quite a, quite a long time uh, here. She even speaks uh, Mandarin here, but we're not going to do this now, right? No. Because we have no <laughs> translators anymore. So, um, floor is uh, yours. I hope you don't need that. Ah, well, I do have a PPT, actually, but let's see if I'm luckier with this. By now, I'll keep it here. Um, well, thanks, first of all, for the invitation and for the introduction. Um, I mean, Alicia, I read through your study, and it's impressive, I mean, uh, because... It's very challenging, uh, I think, also to find comparable data that, that allows really to compare China with other countries because there are so many different sources uh, of, such, uh, of such a data. There is no unique database, so this is uh, definitely very challenging. Uh, and as you said, uh, it doesn't even, it's not part of the OECD, and as such, uh, that makes it, uh, of course, very, very difficult. Um, okay, what was the secret? Uh, <laughs> Here. And uh, this is something you, you also mentioned in the, in, the, in the study, of course, uh, I mean, both you and the other author, of course, by saying that by looking into data coming mainly from 2010, 2012, of course, uh, you couldn't, I mean, there was a limit per se in the sense that you couldn't really um, look at, at um, as what happened from then uh, to now. And there has been a lot of changes, of course, happening in China in that specific um, time frame. Um, and I mean, obviously, this is true for each country, for each regions of the world, because three, five years um, for the digital sector is really a generation. But especially, I would say, for China. And the first thing I thought when I was reading, of course, this was, OK, Tencent, WeChat, was created in 2011. 
and we all know that that created a huge uh, disrupt disruption in the in the way the Chinese society works, in the way Chinese people uh, work. Uh, I would say play, live, do uh, everything really with their smartphones through WeChat, and that is from 2011. But then, even in the short, in, even in the last few years or even months, there has been even much more coming up. And here, I just put some examples in those. Uh, Logos. I mean, Pinduoduo, uh, three years of history, it became the third e-commerce platform uh, with 33 billion uh, US dollar valuation at the moment. Uh, Didi, well, everybody knows uh, what happened also recently. It was all over the news with the story of uh, Uber China, of course. Uh, Jinru Toutiao, the news aggregator, which has also caused a lot of changes in the way people, yeah, of course, read uh, the news. Uh, through the use of big data, which tells them basically what they are kind of, um, let's say, reading. Lacking coffee, May 20th, and being, there is so much, um, of course, uh, going on. And uh, this being said, of course, the, the conclusions are, 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 I mean, somehow, somewhat, I mean, different from maybe other studies, some, but in other ways, uh, more coherent. I mean, it depends on which study you compare this with. Uh, to me, I was specifically impressed by two findings that you mentioned just now. First, indeed, is uh, knowing that China's relative labor productivity of ICT is higher than the OECD average. And this might be, uh, let's say, a revision versus what one normally associates China with, which is a very labor-intense country. Uh, this uh, means uh, that instead there is a lot of technology on the base uh, and a lot of, of course, innovation being um, happening uh, to, to get this data. And, uh, and, um, and the other one uh, is, uh, yeah, based on you, the new methodology that you suggest, using value-added and employment, of course, as factors to count, the, to count the digital economy, that China's digital economy is not bigger than the OECD average. And uh, this actually is not completely a revolution versus other studies, because I, I, I read from the World Bank, for example, or the World Economic Forum. According to those rankings, China stands uh, relatively, I mean, re respectively, number 50th and number 59th uh, in, in the rankings, of respective rankings. One was on Digital Adoption Index, the other one, the World Economic Forum, looked at Networked Readiness Index. Um, but then what this all means, indeed, is that the potential is huge. We just scrapped the surface of the potential of the digital economy of China. So we just saw the point of the iceberg, and there is much more to come. And, uh, and two areas which uh, really can uh, encapsulate, let's say, this potential is in the rural uh, areas, uh, in the less developed uh, regions, as you also pointed out in the study, because that's where you see, of course, much, um, much potential to be yet developed. And on the other side is also in the services, because the graph we showed before, which was using traditional measurements still, uh, looking at the exports, uh, you saw how in the goods, of course, uh, China stands, I don't remember now, over 30% of the share, whereas in the services, only a few less than 10%. So, and okay, then there is other studies instead which, uh, which give different uh, scenarios, different conclusions, and that maybe inflates a bit this, uh, uh, yeah, the, the size of the digital economy, such as McKinsey, Global Institutes, for instance, or KICT, which is a think tank within the MIT, the Ministry of uh, Industry and Information uh, uh, Technology in China. According to which, uh, China would be the second in the world after the US, uh, with a digital economy which is as, as big as one-third of its own GDP. Um, so this is just a brief commentary on, uh, on, on the study. And, and, and at the end of the day, to be honest, is, 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 there is not too much need, I would say, to argue about the different methodologies. The point here we are all making, I, uh, I suppose, through this uh, event today, is that the China, the size of the digital economy, is too big to be ignored. And here I would like to move to the second um, point I would like to raise, and it's uh, its impact uh, on European businesses first, and also on uh, European consumers. Again, before as I open, I mentioned first of all WeChat, uh, and here I would like to really continue with this example, 
uh, to show um, to really show opportunities for for European businesses through WeChat. So which I will know, I mean, if you are here in, in, in this event today, of course, you have heard of it uh, and uh, you know about its, uh, its potential. Uh, it's, uh, it's today has one billion uh, million active users, uh, of course, most of which are in China, but not all of them, around 100 million outside of, uh, of China. And it's an ecosystem because it's not just as many maybe simplistically uh, reduces it as a WhatsApp of China, but it's it's much more, it's much beyond. You can really literally do everything you need in China. And uh, as of last year, uh, Tencent, I mean, which had developed also a new, uh, let's say, feature within the ecosystem, which are, which are the so-called mini programs, are kind of like mini applications um, that, that do not require to be installed, are already within the system, and allow for a lot of features which allow enables businesses to connect with the users and with the consumers directly, interact with them, to sell them products, to, to really uh, in, involve them also through games and quizzes and stuff like that to really um, yeah, create this kind of uh, enhance, let's say, the consumer experience. And uh, here I would like to mention one uh, of such uh, mini programs that we as China U today are working with. Uh, we go you. Uh, this is a, well, a joint venture between the biggest telecom operator of the Netherlands, KPN, and Sunway, their partner in China, which is a trusted partner of WeChat. And, uh, and what it does is really, it's a, it's a, well, it's a mini program, and uh, here uh, it really allows um, travelers, in this case, I mean, Chinese travelers to Europe to um, get the best travel experience in, 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 in our region. So from the point of view of the businesses, that means that they can really uh, connect with such, uh, with such users, which is uh, also an increasing piece of the China market, of course, an important uh, market. And uh, uh, this is true for, for different sectors, for the tourism suppliers, for the transport companies, uh, for, for shops, uh, for restaurants, you know, and, and so on. Uh, so here I could talk a lot about this, but I think the video which I'm planning to show now will do a better job because it can really you can really see from there how the consumer experience would work uh, in in practice. Let's see if it's. Uh, I suppose I do this. Mm. Maybe somebody, yeah, somebody behind us to activate this. <laughs> Here, but perhaps we can continue. I think everybody is already sufficiently impressed <laughs> by the technology. No. By the example. Yeah, can ask one second. Uh, well, uh, yeah. I can describe it. Uh, let's say <laughs> even if it's not time. there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so basically the whole purpose is uh, to announce uh, the Chinese users, the Chinese tourists when they come to Europe, to do everything within the platform to really experience, let's say, Europe like a European, but as if they were in China. So using the same exact thing, you know, they're used to in China. So that means uh, they're able to, uh, to pay, uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's starting. Oh, yeah. I, I always speak over it, that's not a problem. Uh, and so, for example, here is a, well, the Chinese uh, lady arriving in Amsterdam in Schiphol Airport, and she has to find her way to go uh, to, the, uh, well, to the city of Amsterdam. She sees uh, through, the, through the app that she can take the train, and she actually books the ticket and pays for it through WeChat Pay uh, directly. The same experience can be basically replicated also to the, well, tourism, in this case she's, uh, she's in a uh, race museum, and same story, she has booked uh, her ticket and paid for it on the platform. For the shops, similarly speaking, uh, she's able to, um, through pay, uh, through, through the app, and to even get a coupon, a discount, which makes the, let's say, gives her the incentive to, to go through that specific shop. And here, uh, the restaurant experience. Uh, which is, yeah. And it is true for all Europe. It's not happening only in one city, but it's, it's all over in the biggest, most popular cities, and you can scan it uh, to, to access it. I think this is enough, yeah. And, 
and that this is the last point I would like to make. Um, no, well, actually, this. Uh, so bef that was about the impact for the businesses, and this here I would like to raise a point on what could be the impact for consumers in Europe. And this is platform I think is not very well known yet, but I know it's trending quite a lot in some media, uh, in uh, at least talking about China. It's called Xiaobufa, and it's basically an app that allows you allows uh, users to, to record their steps as they walk. So it's a fitness, let's say, app. But here is not the, the novelty because this maybe is, exists already, actually for sure exists already in the US. But the difference is that uh, here you, int you link it, they link it with e-commerce. So if you walk more, you get discounts on products that you can buy online. And not only that, but if you walk more, that means you are in theory healthier because, well, or at least less prone to get some health hazards. And so you can get a better deal for your, your health insurance. And that's, you can see how the, something which is digital has direct impacts on the real economy and, and on business. And that's, I think, what really makes uh, China so amazing and so creative in this uh, old, old, old system. By the way, here is a screenshot from, um, well, the LinkedIn of Matthew Brennan, who you may have heard as one of the speakers, frequent speakers on WeChat, and uh, he is aware I'm using this. Next um, and final point, and, and that maybe brings to your also introduction um, about about uh, innovation. Because at the end of the day, uh, also big companies we mentioned before about Google, Facebook, but also Tencent, Baidu, if they want to innovate, they need to look at the sources, engines of innovations, which are not necessarily within the company. At one point, maybe they stagnate, right? They reach a plateau within the company, within the big corporation. Uh, where it's really difficult to, to engage more users or to, well, yeah, to innovate, uh, to, to do some new breakthroughs in technology. And that comes then from out, outside, from startups. In China, we see that for different reasons, so in here I mentioned two, uh, there is a, a relative easiness, easiness at which startups can grow. I mean, first of all, rise and then grow, at least in the first years of their life. And this is also because of, of, uh, of a lack of red tape at the beginning by the Chinese government, which allow um, phenomena like the one of uh, Mobike, right? And also uh, the availability of funding. So before we talked about artificial intelligence, and here is the data saying that China now ranks first in attracting AI for startups, even before the US. So this is also another, I mean, all these things, of course, can hardly be maybe encapsulated in graphs and uh, uh, measurements, right, to, to really um, calculate the size of a digital economy, but it should be maybe looked at uh, to see the direction of where China's uh, digital economy is going and to be even more assertive then in this way that it will grow for sure even more in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so in order to avoid that we uh, end up discussing is it big or is it not big, <laughs> let me try to reconcile a bit. I think what the, the main message is that both of you would, would agree on is that uh, at least in innovation, uh, China is really at the frontier. It's concentrated in few players, uh, and their ecosystems is concentrated in few geographic uh, areas here. But that also holds in the US, so it's also in, in Europe here. Um, so it's particularly still an issue is this diffusion uh, of, of digital uh, further than these, these concentrated areas here. And there, I think, uh, you, you rightly pointed out, there's still quite a lot of potential that's not yet exploited, but where uh, we actually could expect China will actually be very good in fast diffusing here, perhaps faster diffusing than what we are doing uh, in, in Europe uh, here. Um, I would like actually to concentrate the discussion a bit more on what the implications are for the EU uh, of this. Um, so to which extent is these, are these opportunities, and particularly the opportunities for diffusion, will they be mostly for the Chinese uh, big players here, or will there also be room for uh, EU companies uh, here? How open is the Chinese market for our companies to serve? Um, also, how open uh, is the Chinese market to, top, to tap on all this local expertise and sources of know-how, particularly the these trained graduates here, how uh, can European companies also tap on that uh, for their digital uh, here? And how can Chinese uh, know-how and innovation be actually be used for consumers on the EU market? The example of the WeGo EU was an example of that. But the question is who captures actually the value from these kind of, of uh, 
uh, of initiatives uh, here. So how much European consumers and, and firms can actually um, exploit these kind of um, uh, opportunities uh, here. So before we go to the floor, I would like to give first the opportunity to the speakers to uh, address a bit those questions on, the, on, on what this implies for EU companies and for what kind of policy we should be going for. Alicia, you want to start? Uh, well, I guess so far the, our views were very aligned in the sense that I, I, the, the, the idea, as you rightly pointed out, was not so much to measure or to focus on the measurement, which was the objective of the paper, but on the opportunities. And, and, and Claudia picked up the two that I, I was trying to highlight, the rural areas and the services, yeah, uh, very clearly. Um, but I, I think she also added one that was not in my paper because I didn't focus on the financing, but was implicit in your in your presentation when you talked about how easy it is to fund a startup in China. Uh, you were mentioning 48% of of uh, the equity of AI is in China, and I guess we could even look at it more generally as a general trend. So so easy funding deregulation, no privacy concerns, yeah, uh, plus the, 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 the future growth of the market because of the segmentation of China's digital economy in very large cities so far, or few large cities, uh, and the aspect of services as a new growth engine. So, so with all of that, the question is, wow, this looks so interesting for any European company in the sector, yeah? But the reality is that, I mean, so far, not really. And maybe I leave it up to Claudia to explain <laughs> why, but, but I mean, and we're not the only ones. I, I have a very good friend uh, working for Google in Hong Kong, um, head of uh, pol uh, government affairs. And you know, and, and he co she calls this the retrenchment to Hong Kong. <laughs> retrenchment to Hong Kong. Uh, this says it all about Google's strategy in China, that they are trying to restart. Uh, there was a very interesting article in the New York Times yesterday as to why they want to restart it. And the reason is not market access, meaning they even have a hope that that will be the next big bang, which didn't work the first time, but will work this time. Uh, but it's more like they're falling so behind in terms of data access, that they will basically lose the battle even elsewhere. It's not even about China's market itself. So to answer your question, I think, wow, I mean, what looks like a wonderful opportunity, if anything, only serves the purpose of obtaining the data that we cannot obtain in our own home markets. So this put, puts us in a very difficult situation. And, and we had a very, very heated discussion this morning. Some of you may have been here on exactly this topic, yeah? I mean, uh, the, the ideas are really far apart. Uh, uh, China argues that the market is open, their market economy, the, I mean, everything is open. However, our, business, our businesses don't seem to agree with this. And on, on digital, I think, I mean, if there's anything on earth where, where you can find more of a uh, divergence. This is exactly the sector because uh, it's obviously a strategic sector. Uh, not that there, are, that there are few strategic sectors in China, N nearly all of them are strategic, but certainly, rightly so, digital is, is a strategic sector. So my point is, yes, I see the opportunities, but are they for us? It's really the question that you know I would basically pass on to Claudia to mm. pass a hot potato, but, but <laughs> my answer would be not really so far unless we, I see major, major, major changes in, in mar market access and the way China operates uh, um, in, in those ecosystems that you rightly pointed out to be very few, even in China. Yeah? So it might not be only China, but it has severe implications in the case of China in terms of market access for the rest of the world. Yeah. 
Yeah, I fully agree also this access to data is a very important uh, issue here. The question is then which kind of policy instruments should we be really addressing to get access uh, to, to those opportunities for EU companies. Um, Claudia, you want to? Yeah, and thank you. Is indeed, uh, I feel the pressure of the hot potato already. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I will try to indeed uh, give some concrete examples of the opportunities which indeed are not to be given for granted. And, uh, and I know very well that uh, for foreign companies to access a Chinese digital market, well, it's not easy. It's not easy for companies which have a lot of capital to, to, to waste. Uh, so we also saw the example of Uber. I mean, it didn't turn out very badly for Uber in the sense that they got a lot of money uh, from you know, the, the acquisition, fine. But I guess that was not the main purpose, right, to, to, to get cash. Um, and so I, I would like to continue one of the examples I raised, which is about this Xiao Bufa. And OK, actually, it was an app that eventually helps uh, Chinese um, consumers, not European consumers. So why? And I forgot actually to, to make the link, logical link there. Why I'm saying this can be seen as an opportunity for the European user, users. And that is not really uh, directly maybe accessing the market, but maybe for European companies to emulate the business model. Uh, I mean, the fact that you see, uh, for example, WhatsApp copying, which is like, well, it sounds some almost unbelievable because it used to be the other way around, or at least in the traditional way you, you, you see things. But now it's, uh, it's indeed Facebook, it's American companies looking at the model of WeChat and replicating it back. And in the same way, for example, talking about the case of, um, of this link between fitness and, uh, and, 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 um, and digital, why, for example, we don't copy the idea and, for example, Chinese com uh, European companies can, can give uh, the, their employees an incentive, also through maybe bonuses at the end of the year, uh, to, their, to those who go to, to work instead of using a car or a public transport, maybe using a bike or walking there and they get you know, this uh, monitor through this kind of applications. Maybe it's, it's a bit of a, of a nazar what I'm saying, but I mean, the, I think the spillovers in the business model is, is, is one thing I see really, this kind of opportunity. Uh, because China, I think, can be of inspiration, not just the market itself can be an important, uh, of course, a piece of the story, but it's also about, um, yeah, really spillovers in the business model. I don't know if I express myself rightly. Mm -hmm. And then on, on the second point on, on, on sources of innovation, and so yes, in China, startups raise and you know, can grow, can try at, at a very fast speed, which is maybe more difficult in Europe. I mean, the fact that Facebook, for instance, indeed, they're not there in their core business, but they did get a license to open up a subsidiary in uh, Zhejiang province. And there, the purpose was actually to create an incubator to get access to some of these, say, maybe sources of growth, which could be startups from Chinese startups. Eventually, and I think that it has been a reaction also of the of uh, what we were talking this morning about the trade war between, uh, so-called trade war between US and China. This uh, license was eventually taken back by the government. So, um, yeah. Uh, so I, I tried to, I don't know if I did uh, manage my, my yeah, objectives to, to give two examples. One on about business model, uh, spillovers, if you wish, and then about startup access and innovation through in, the, in this other way. Yeah. So you keep an optimistic... Uh, uh, yeah, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you think that there would also be spillovers from um, uh, adopting a bit of the Chinese policy models for Europe or not? Um, Is that irrelevant? You, you mean, for instance, about uh, privacy or...? Yeah, and so for instance, yeah. the extent to which the Chinese government is actually a big driver of demand for big data here that really helps to, uh, to stimulate a lot of AI applications. Yeah, I think on, on this point, I'm not an expert uh, on, on these specifics, so I don't really dare too much to enter into a field which is not my own, but uh, I, I don't think in Europe at the moment we, we are, well, let's say, close to accept the view of China and, and, and how China really um, collects yeah, and allows also the, the flow of data within, uh, within the country. Uh, GDPR is something which is uh, a little bit yeah. in concept far away from the Chinese concept of right uh, yeah. data access. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Okay. 
So I think it's time to open up the floor and give the opportunity to you uh, to ask questions. Yeah. Before you start, can you also identify? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Todd Buell. I'm a journalist with uh, Law360, and I'm, it's a sister publication to MLEX. Maybe that is known to you. So I write a lot about tax policy, and I wanted to, I, I know people I talk to say that they're a little bit concerned that China may take some sort of I don't know, retaliatory action against the EU if the EU would adopts this you know, digital services tax, and I just wanted to get the views of the panel about you know, the DST and China and what the ramifications to that might be. So I'll leave it a little bit vague so you can yeah. fill in the gaps if you want. Okay, that's a very technical question here. Perhaps we collect a few and then we will be able to, to answer more efficiently. <laughs> I'm Mr. Baruti. I'm senior research, research a fellow in research with Montessori Juridique African. It's a group of African lawyers. But um, by training, I'm myself a lawyer specialized in shipping and maritime business. And I know in the maritime business, the data that the poll sector shows uh, officially is not <coughs> is not always is not the real data that the ports itself produce for strategical uh, reasons and uh, the the port authority try to hide some data from the port and I, my question to madame alicia uh, I, you read that she's working in the university or so with the university. And I want to know if she took into consideration that aspect of uh, official data and real data of a, a, a company and digital uh, economy from China. Because Madame Chair asked us to consider two sides, European Union and uh, China side. So it's quite normal that China try to give the data that they, it wants, but not necessarily the real data. Thank you. Hi, um, Nicola Moes from the, the Future Society. Uh, I am uh, I'm actually interested in the opinion of the, the panelists on uh, the room for, for cooperation, of course, like we have talked about the economic aspect, but uh, there is, of course, the legislative and political aspect. And since uh, GDPR, one of the key statements about it was to try to set a global standard about uh, data privacy. Obviously, there are cultural differences about privacy concerns. Uh, but also, I know that in, in China, for example, the AI strategy is also very much focused on trying to set up uh, global technical standards for, for AI development. So there are intentions on both sides to set global standards. And I was wondering whether uh, this need to discuss global standards, at least, or maybe not global, but at least China, EU, Eurasian standard, maybe uh, uh, was being uh, Currently addressed by policymakers or anything. Thank you. Model and what I hear is that everything is we have. The Chinese system is very closed off to anything that's European and also vice versa. Uh, is, isn't this the, the, where the future trade frictions or trade wars will be? I mean, it started in the WTO with uh, you know, the, the, the complaint against China's uh, cybersecurity practices, but with, uh, with new apps coming into Europe, uh, and I already heard complaints about, you know, e-commerce discussions in the WTO, but the China, Chinese want to do direct selling here. Um, I just wanted to get, maybe you I mean, uh, Alicia, you, you talk more about trade policy issues, uh, have your views about, you know, the future and where this could lead, 
the new China trade relationship going forward. Okay, so I think we now take a first reaction and then we return back to, to the... So who wants to take first the floor? So there were the tax issues, data manipulation <laughs> possibilities, GDPR, global standards, warfare standards, um, and then also trade policy implications from these different types of markets in, in digital uh, here. So who would like to start? Maybe I'll start. Um, it, uh, on the last question, I think you're absolutely right that um, the new level of trade wars will clearly include e-commerce. Uh, and I think China is getting ready for this. This is related to standards in a way because on the e-commerce world, what I've seen looking at M&A data, China's M&A in 2017, with, we had this discussion in, in the previous session, has collapsed in the US but has massively increased in Europe. Europe mainly uh, in uh, actually EU excluding UK mainly in industrial technology and UK mainly in infra. So UK is very different from the rest of the EU in terms of what the Chinese are buying. Now it comes to the point of e-commerce, I'll get there. When you look at uh, Belt and Road geographies, which is the other massive growth area of Chinese m and it's mainly e-commerce. So you, you have Lazada in Indonesia, there, there is a I think uh, I can't remember the name of the Indian platform they've bought on the um, tourism space. So there's a lot of that, which to me means sourcing the technology from Europe for their upgrade of their manufacturing industry uh, to, to move further up the ladder, to then export to where the new middle class is being created, i.e. the Belt and Road geographies or the emerging world, if, uh, more simply given that this uh, reality of VRI anyway is growing as we speak in terms of countries targeted and so 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 to make it simple the emerging world and i think this is kind of the strategy so the standards come as a consequence of this yeah because as you um, as you incorporate more platforms you basically kind of align those platforms to your standards and, and in that regard, I wonder whether there, there is a willingness to, at this point in time, before China has more of that market of e-commerce globally in these new economies, whether there is an intention to, to bring our standards, our European and Chinese standards together at this point in time. Maybe you want to have a, a larger market share before you do that so that you can be you can be in a better negotiating position to impose your own standards. That's my reading, at least for e-commerce. Um, uh, even payment systems, by all means. So if you look at uh, even Japan, you know, the very, very fast uh, uh, diffusion of uh, Alipay in Japan, wherever the Chinese tourists are, basically, because this is one of the key uh, channels of entry, yeah? Uh, uh, the tourists we receive in Europe are nothing compared to the tourists that Japan, let alone Thailand, receive from China. So there, the, uh, I think the pressure to accept those payment stand e-payment standards is much, much stronger. So that takes the, the two questions. Maybe I can come up to the to the rest later, but I let Claudia talk yeah. so that it's not so long. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I do struggle a little bit to understand, um, I guess, the issue with e-commerce in the sense that, I mean, when we talk about, uh, well, okay, through Chinese platforms, Chinese companies can sell more of the products to China. So it's an increase of the exports of the European industry into China. I'm making an example, linking back to the project I described before, about the luxury products, the luxury companies, money, money suppliers. Most of them are from the European Union. Italy, France, Germany are, I think, the big ones. And data shows that one third of the global luxury sales today are both by China and especially by Chinese who travel overseas. Uh, so the fact that 
these companies can through Alibaba's platforms such as Tmall or through Tencent's other uh, platforms like Weibo or as I described before, WeChat and uh, etc. or through the use of, yes, also other digital ways to position your brand in China like Chinese uh, KOLs, key opinion leaders and so on, I think it's a good opportunity that we should actually embrace. Um, back to the, to the standards on GDPR, I mean, yes, for sure there could be um, some maybe a joint uh, work group that may, perhaps maybe the commission could take initiative to, to, to create with China. Before there was one being created with, um, on the topic of fake news, for instance, where also Alibaba participated. It's a pity that perhaps you don't have Alibaba here to share, because I think the, uh, the person would have been the nice. <laughs> we almost had somebody yeah. from Alibaba. But yeah, exactly. Last would have been probably the best person to, yeah. to indeed uh, talk about uh, these issues. Alibaba, for instance, in, even uh, raised the idea to, to create this EWTP, right? A new, uh, new. Um, Kind of WTO, but for the e-commerce, so that, that would have been probably the best, uh, the, per the best person to have a view on. And on standards, I mean, there has already, there is already been at least on, on not on GDPR, but on 5G, for instance, of course, going on, uh, and I mean, ministerial level, and later on also with the industry involvement about discussions on how to indeed create a standard which is uh, one uniform one for both Europe and China, and I think we are proceeding in that direction. Um, yeah. So, in terms of, of, of the policy discussion and what kind of policy instruments, um, so of course there's the access to market uh, discussion, and that's both making sure that EU companies have access to the to the Chinese market, but also to what extent Chinese companies have access to, to, to European markets. And then I think an important instrument is indeed this uh, standards uh, here, because that creates a lot of uh, opportunities for market access or not. But um, there is also the issue of to which extent we can actually learn from the business models, mm -hmm. like, like you were actually saying. Of course, it also depends a lot on standards. If standards are very different, it will be much more difficult yeah. to, to, to have these spillovers here. But there is also the issue of, of IPR, so to which extent can business models actually be protected and can value uh, be captured. Um, so that's also an important uh, policy instrument, I think, to, to take into account IPR. And then also competition policy, uh, I think, because these are usually very big players in these markets that help to set standards um, and also capture the value from, from these standards here. So competition policy uh, is definitely also an important instrument and also related to mergers and acquisitions that you, you were discussing uh, here. Uh, as Europe doesn't have these big players, very often mergers and acquisitions in these uh, sectors take place by large players buying up the small startups here. So to which extent do we need to use competition policy also to have a level playing field in these uh, mergers and acquisitions? So of all these instruments, where do you think uh, the, the biggest uh, challenges will be then? Is it the war on standards? Is it the war on IPR? Is it competition policy? I'm, um, I'm aware that these are unfair yeah. questions. <laughs> okay, perhaps before I answer, I wanted to make two comments on on what we can get. Out. I mean, glad I was trying rightly so because we need to be optimistic given what's happening in the world. But I'm thinking that if our key takeaway is to emulate, yeah, in our market, uh, China's innovation and to be able to use their e-platforms to sell our products, we're going nowhere, sorry to say. But it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make an argument, and of course you can mm -hmm. counter-argue. The reason is the following. There, I start with the second. As China moves into basically e-commerce dominating yeah, their, consumer, the, their consumer market, and these been very uh, concentrated platforms in which we have no say. I have actually a, a personal experience with Taobao uh, of, a, of a European company trying to actually register. Because it's very easy to sell goods to a platform. The point is, do you control the platform by all means and purposes? Mm -hmm. If not, your margin is dependent on platforms you can't control. So I just think that, you know, eventually, uh, 
we could be massively marginalized by only depending on these platforms. This is the first thing, because we don't have similar platforms. We, we, and by the way, by, by fact of the growth of those platforms as opposed to, as you know, brick and mortar type of sales of our luxury goods in China, basically they're squeezed, There's, they have to squeeze their margins to accept the terms and conditions of these platforms. So this is one. On the emulation though, uh, again, and this is very much dependent on how open we are. And here we can have a very different views. I don't know the European situation well enough, but imagine we are in as far as it complies with rules and regulations in Europe. So you emulate a platform, and the minute after that platform comes to your uh, ecosystem and, and has m much more experience because it's not only emulating, but it has actually created this idea. So how do you compete with that? I mean, uh, I, I just feel that it's very difficult to rely only in, on emulation with a relatively open market. I'm not arguing, and I'm sure, Rangel, you know more than me on this. How open we are, we don't know, but probably we're more open than China, maybe. And if that statement is true, which I can't really prove, then emulation is not the answer because you emulate to lose your own market eventually. So I guess we have to think of other options. Uh, uh, I don't know which options. Rangile, you are the European expert. <laughs> you, you tell I, me. I actually would, would like to extend the question to Claudia. So mm. the example that you gave on this we go Europe yep. uh, example. So who captures the value from that? So there was a good example of yep. where yep. Uh, yep. the Chinese yep. model was emulated. This was, I guess, done in joint venture with the Chinese yes, company in this or not? And, and who yep. captured the value from that? <laughs> that was very, very true. Your... But in this specific case that I mentioned, uh, it is indeed a joint venture so it's and that's why I raised it uh, because it's it's a, it's a joint project between a European company which is a telecom operator and uh, and a Chinese one so I the, I would suppose the margin is in uh, is gonna be divided between the two um, and uh, as to yeah, the other question about uh, what should be the, the best policy mix uh, if it's uh, on IPR competition policy through MA control um, I think that the, the problem really is is a different one. The problem, and I don't know how to solve. I don't know if there is even a solution. But I believe the problem has to do with the fact that perhaps Europe lacks uh, a, a, somehow a solid uh, industrial policy. Because then you will, you may say, okay, you, now we are arguing why uh, indeed there is Alibaba, there is Tencent, which are maybe threatening to enter here, but. Do we have an Amazon? Do we have an eBay? I don't think so. So perhaps uh, the real question is, uh, is, is, is more than access to the market. It's about uh, yeah, why don't we have our own, you know, these this, this tools, our own, so that we wouldn't have to maybe uh, defend ourselves, let's say, from Made in China 2025, but neither we would need to defend ourselves from America first. So yeah. do we need an industrial policy for that? Where do we get our big players <laughs> in, the, in the digital market uh, from? Yeah, big question. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to turn back to the floor for a second round of uh, questions. Or have we raised too many big questions that now <laughs> you've become completely pessimistic? <laughs> OK, Scott. Uh, yes, uh, Scott Marcus. I'm a senior fellow here. So actually, back to this question that you were just closing on a second ago. Um, I know I was presenting a, a paper about e-commerce at a conference in Japan, and, and uh, a lot of the feedback I got there was that one of the reasons why the Japanese, why the Chinese e-commerce had taken off so dramatically, was due to relative weakness of brick and mortar commerce in China. And I'd be interested in some, some comments on that. If you look at the statistics, by the way, for Asia, uh, China is very effective as an e-commerce exporter. If you compare that to many other countries in the Asia-Pacific region, they're not nearly as good as exporting. I mean, Japan's a pretty strong economy, but they have very little e-commerce exporting. So the Chinese have been successful at it. There are probably many elements to that, uh, including the fact, by the way, that their shipment costs uh, tend to be favorable. Uh, it's often claimed, uh, I think rightly, that partly due to distortions in the postal regulation system and the fact that they're treated as a developing country for postal purposes, that they can ship at lower cost to European customers than many European vendors can ship. 
So um, anyway, I'd, I'd be interested on, on, on your thoughts on how some of these factors impact on, uh, on e-commerce provision from China. Thank you. Yeah. So again, we're going to collect some questions. Yeah. It's a simple question. Uh, here you are presenting the digital economy of China, Westerners, let's say. Chinese, they were here okay, and uh, maybe they are still <laughs> well, well, as as you we already mentioned, so we did invite Alibaba, but she dropped out last minute here. So we try to have a balanced, balance having the different views here. But also, I have to say that Bert, Alicia, and Claudia have very much experience uh, of, the, of the Chinese market uh, here. They they each live and li of, or have lived in China substantially here. So it's not that they are the pure Western voice here. <laughs> I am, though. <laughs> yeah. Do we have some more questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, sure? Just allow myself, because nobody asked us. Could, yeah. could, uh, uh, could you, Claudia, explain a bit more uh, how these uh, Chinese startups are financed? Because uh, I was mentioning a better about financing. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. it just the state uh, allowing money in, or is it a more complex picture? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have to turn it off, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask, um, where does, so, oh, sorry, my name is uh, Solange Chatelard and I'm a researcher at the ULB. Um, I just wanted to ask, where does politics fit in all of this? Uh, we talk about e-commerce, we talk about the economy, um, you know, where does the state interference and state intervention and state implications, you know, the, the sort of the larger security stakes are hold behind all this, where does that fit? Yep. It's all very uh, big questions. So first one was on, on e-commerce and what explains why it has taken off so well in, in, in China here, this lack of brick and mortar markets, uh, access to finance. Uh, um, the issue of financing of uh, mergers and acquisitions, you also mentioned that maybe, uh, and then the big <laughs> elephant in the room, where is policy driving these forces uh, here both in China? Uh, you. Who wants to start? Perhaps you. Um, yeah, sure. So, on why yeah, e-commerce uh, developed so fast in China. Um, uh, there was a book recently, well, not too recently anymore, but I think it was two years ago, one year ago now, by Duncan Clark, which uh, who described uh, basically the. Um, it's kind of a biography of Jack Ma, but eventually describes a lot about the market. So I think. He proposed certain, I mean, some some answers. He gave some answers to to to, us, to your question. I mean, indeed, the the shipping cost being much lower in China, and, and not just the cost, but also the the speed. Uh, it's one factor because uh, in China, by the time you settle your order to the time you actually get uh, the thing at home or at office, wherever you are, it's really a matter of um, days or even hours or even uh, actually minutes. On jelly.com, in, in certain districts of Beijing, it's possible to get the stuff you want delivered within 15 minutes. And they do that because they send trucks already all moving. I mean, the trucks which are always on the move already have products switched through big data analysis. They know in that district, or for, for, for instance, Chaoyan district in Beijing, they, 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 they tend to prefer to buy a lot of, I don't know, maybe glass, uh, plastic uh, glasses, and so they already put in the truck a lot of plastic glasses so that they know that most likely they, they, somebody will order that and they have it already uh, available. So that is one, the delivery yeah, cost, but also the facility and, and the speed. Uh, and, and the lack of brick and mortar in certain areas, that was also mentioned indeed, as uh, in certain areas there is no other option than e-commerce. So the same way, uh, I mean, why mobile uh, payments have been able in certain areas to to bypass the credit card and going from directly from cash, then the same way, really, for, for in this situation, because simply there is no shopping mall, physical shopping mall where you can go. Though recently you see a lot of actually these uh, well, e-commerce company moving back to the brick and mortar also. At least there is a lot of this offline, online uh, thingy now happening in China. So, but uh, but sure, as as of why in the first place e-commerce developed so far has been also because in certain 
less developed areas, not the big cities of China, but in other areas, indeed, there were no uh, shopping malls. Um, and so can I follow up on yeah. that? Because also Alicia mentioned that there is still this huge scope for, for diffusion to even less developed areas. Do you think that, uh, so what you mentioned, uh, this lack of brick and mortar infrastructure mm -hmm. and whatever, and shipping cost infrastructure, would that also be sufficiently developed to have developments to those areas too? Or do we still uh, still there have a shipping cost infrastructure problem? Well, um, I know that Alibaba had a plan, uh, now I don't remember until within what year exactly, but to make sure that each and every product can be shipped from one side of, uh, of China to another at maximum within one day and globally within three days or something like that. So I mean, if they made this statement, I think there is a plan behind it because normally they they deliver on, on, on their promises, on their yeah. plans. Uh, and and I mean, before I mentioned Pinduoduo being now the third e-commerce platform, they made, um, well, most of their fortune by actually accessing indeed the rural areas uh, rather than the urban ones. So it is an opportunity. I think, uh, I think so. So can I also tie to the question that you raised in terms of, of taxes? So to which extent uh, are local taxes, uh, how do they solve that in China here to have an uh, e-commerce market uh, here? So that's what we were discussing in, in, in Europe. Do we have too much fragmentation on the tax system uh, here. Can we learn anything from China there in terms of the, how I do they tax this e-commerce market? I wouldn't dare to answer on this one because I'm really not... Um, prepared on the tax uh, policy of China, so I would yeah, have to no skip this question. Yeah, and you also not. Uh, well, I think this is one of the key deterrents for for the acceptance of Chinese e-commerce outside. I mean, we have Taobao in Hong Kong, but I know from mm -hmm. Thai uh, friends of mine that it's very hard, no matter the 60 plus million Chinese in, in you know, uh, in, in Thailand every year, to actually develop it, and one of the reasons is the tax sharing, you know. Um, so, so I think it's a very, indeed, a very important topic. In Hong Kong, we don't have any VAT, so you know, it makes it easier. Uh, let alone the fact that it's, of course, part of China. But beyond that, I mean, it, it's just no VAT to be shared. So, but uh, based on the experience of Hong Kong, going back to the cost of transportation, I think it is obviously subsidized, obviously subsidized, and I think. The, I mean, that's, that's the model uh, to enter a market. Um, and, and I think the idea is that that subsidy eventually will pay off because you, 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 you save on the distribution channels. So you could read the BRI, you were talking about, you know, um, a gigantic uh, uh, investment in infrastructure as a way to uh, access markets mm -hmm. more quickly in terms of, uh, of course, uh, uh, transportation of goods and and still uh, still get your numbers right because you save on those distribution channels if, if you use e-commerce. So, so yeah, I think this is part of the reason because when you look at what they're buying, it's very obvious that they want to control the, the, the target e-commerce uh, channel in those key countries, India, Indonesia. I mean, the largest, actually they've bought on the largest uh, consumer, emerging consumer markets in the world. So to me, uh, this is the reading of, of um, kind of paving that transportation of goods through uh, infra investment and then controlling the distribution so i mean it, it's a very it's it's a very good strategy it's just that you know we happen to be europeans but if i were chinese i would say you know chapeau because it makes sense but as a recipient of all of that of course you wonder i mean what can i do about it yeah because part of the of our value added is on that distribution channel yeah let alone the tax uh, and and because it's our consumers, I mean I, I'm I'm reading this the way a Chinese would say it. Yeah, it's, it's it's my consumers, and we we don't see it this way in Europe. But the reality is that they do. So the question is, do we want to share this consumer surplus? Um, <laughs> do we not want to share it? Uh, I mean I don't know. But but I think we need to start looking at it 
this way, uh, at least as e-commerce is concerned. Yeah. yeah. But I think at least what we should look at in, in Europe and in the single market, digital single market, much more is indeed also reducing the shipping costs and fragmentation in shipping yeah. costs. It's also mm -hmm. something that uh, Scott has looked at uh, here. Um, yeah. yeah. There was also the issue of financing mm -hmm. of uh, and, and uh, through acquisitions, buying up uh, mm -hmm. here. How are these startups funded? Yeah. Maybe yeah, both of you have touched on that. Mm -hmm. You want to say something? Um, yes. I mean, in um, I think it's a mix of the three how startups are yeah receive their fundings in China. So uh, I mean, of course, the state plays a, an important role, but that's true also in in the U.S. in France. I mean. The startups, I mean, to develop at the beginning, they need to have also uh, an, an important uh, contribution by the state. And actually, that's a problem now for the Silicon Valley. Recently, there has been an article on The Economist talking about this, that because the federal state is reducing uh, expenditure on, uh, on R&D, for instance, and that, that has, has reduced in the past, I don't know, 40 years, I think, by one third. And that's also one of the reasons why the Silicon Valley People are, are more and more living, or it's it's a bit more um, of a challenge, let's say, for for the um, even for the innovation uh, cluster in the U.S. Next, uh, I mean, it's private equity, and third, which is very important, is of course the big corporations, BATs. If you look at statistics, they are basically uh, acquiring <laughs> a lot of startups. So I mean, if the startups want to, and this is not for the startup phase, but for the scale-up phase, if they want to develop to a certain level, I mean, one um, natural solution, one natural avenue would be to be integrated both, or at least partially, by the BATs. But uh, that is also similar story in the US, yeah. uh, with Google, Facebook, um, um, also, uh, as I mentioned before, looking at uh, startups as an opportunity to innovate. <coughs> It's not only access to finance, but it's also access to the network and the platform mm. that these large players uh, are offering. Yeah. So do you think that that would be an option for our EU uh, economies to invest in, in startups that then can actually sell at the right prices to uh, mm -hmm. the global players? Do you think we have a fair uh, well, uh, market there? You mean to develop our own startup ecosystem through state in the brand? Well, so the question is, if we want to mm -hmm. develop a startup system, do we then need uh, EU uh, financing of these startups and EU large players that would uh, acquire here, or is it just can we rely on on, on a well-functioning M&A market where the top players mm -hmm. that are in the market will actually pl play the fair price for our? Yeah, no, I think there should be definitely some some uh, some funding from the state. I mean, not just the EU, also governments. I mean, uh, it should be, uh, that should be something definitely that uh, is in place. I mean, most of the incubators also, or accelerator, or uh, hubs function also a big part, part of it also through uh, the help of the government. And this is true, I think, everywhere, not just in China, but also here. Yeah, so there's still some room for policy. Maybe um, I need to answer to Solange because I dragged yes. her into this conference from nine in the morning and it would be really, really unfair if I didn't even answer <laughs> her, her question. But I, before that, I wanted to add that we do have a slight difference. Yeah, We have, a, what, 28 states, so, you know, which might eventually, if not all, some compete for... for um, uh, you know, for for a uh, for a higher status in this uh, innovation um, competition, which is not the case. I mean, you can think of uh, of course competition among companies, but when you also have competition among member states, mm -hmm. it makes things much harder in terms of the way you run your industrial policy. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, one thing that I think beyond the fact we don't have this big. Um, these big leaders uh, doing what Alibaba or Tencent are doing in China, we also don't have a, kind of a real single market, or, or certainly not a single market of state aid, which we don't have either, which would call for the benefit of European as an integrated uh, market. Yeah, So it's very, very hard. But for China, I think the, the, the you, your question about, you know, what's the... 
the politics behind all of this. For me, the best thing I've seen, and this was many years ago, uh, in 2014, in Singapore, Duncan, the, the person who wrote this book about Alibaba, uh, showed us a video of um, Jack Ma in 2000. And it was all about politics. The whole, th the whole message, and he was talking to his you know, other school teachers that mm -hmm. started the company with him in a, in, a, in a small hotel room. I mean, I, it was all about beating the U.S. in 2000. Mm -hmm. He was literally saying he wanted to, he, he wanted an, an IPO in 2000 of Alibaba. It's like, because then China would become what China should have always, uh, should have always, should always have been. You know, I mean, it's like, what a vision, but what a kind of a political vision, you know? This is not a business vision. I don't think a company, startup company in 2000, in any, anywhere in the world, even in the US, would think that way. And there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not criticizing it. I'm saying we need to be aware of it and, and, and understand the implications of, of this reality, that these are indeed, no matter whether they are private or not, which we will never know, by the way, uh, they are national champions. They are national champions, of which, rightly so, Chinese are very proud. Rightly so, I mean, but, but we do not kind of in the West understand the consequences of, of uh, that pride and the consequences of showing the world what China can do, which rightly so, but showing the world what China can do has political implications beyond the business implications we were discussing. And I think we totally missed the point in Europe as to what this really means for us. I think that's a great way to, to end the, the day today here, this, this session as well as the whole day. Um, you can leave the room, I think, uh, as an optimist, saying that, yes, there are still great opportunities from digital technology. You can also leave the room as a pessimist and saying, no, nah, in Europe we've lost it all uh, here. I think as an optimist or as a pessimist, the main message that we all take home with is we need to understand better what the Chinese digital economy is uh, here. So we need to get our facts right on that and monitor this uh, here and try to understand this better, whatever you are, whether you're a pessimist or an optimist uh, here. So that's also something we definitely in Bruegel will uh, have on our agenda here. So we will be keep keep on having events on this uh, where we will try to uh, update you on the state of the Chinese digital economy and helping you to try to understand better how that is evolving here. Thanks for your participation uh, here. Thanks for the panel, Alicia and Claudia here. I hope to see you soon. Yes. <laughs>